All right, so every month in partnership with Grand Valley and Shelburne Public Libraries, we host an author as part of our coffee conversation and book series. And this evening we are thrilled to host Mark Rice. According to Mark, he only does the fun stuff. Many of you probably recognize him from the Alton Mill Art Center, where he has a studio and the gallery and, for the past, and has been there for the past 12 years. Or maybe you recognize him from TV. He hosts Mark Rice, the artist on Rogers TV, where he shares with viewers the process of painting quick landscapes and wildlife scenes. Prior to exploring his artistic side, Mark spent 30 years training horses or show horses for a living. He is also a professional horse show announcer, a licensed wedding officiant and an actor. I guess Mark wasn't having enough fun because then he decided to write an award-winning novel called Paint the Horse Blue, which is built upon his lifetime of experience with horses. The story is anchored on a horse farm in Ontario, and I think I even recognized a few of the places that were mentioned in the story. And it takes place in present day, but spans 100 years back in time and visits 10 states across the US. I won't say any more about the book, though. I'll turn it over to Mark. Um, but before I do, you can find his book available on Amazon and other online bookstores at Booklore and, of course, to borrow at the library. Thanks again for joining us. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. Um, thank you, first of all, just for putting this together in the Orangeville Library. I must say that the first time someone told me that, um, and again, just uh, you can turn off your cameras, just click on the camera icon on your uh, screen as it pops up. And uh, when I heard that someone had taken my book out at the library for the first time, somebody told me they they found my book at the library. I didn't even know my book was at the library. And I think that's the equivalent of a, of a singer he hearing your uh, right. song on the radio for the first time. And um, so that was kind of a thrill for me just to just to know that my my book was in the local library. So thank you for that. I want to talk first of all. I I expect a lot of you have read the book. I'm going to um, treat this as if as if you've read the book, or maybe even if if you haven't, um, I'm not going to really spoil anything for you anyway. I will I will read some of the book later, which is kind of my favorite part. But I want to tell you a little bit about my whole process and how this began for me. Um, probably. Uh, like a lot of people uh, seem to say to me, oh, I would love to write a book. I've always got this idea for a book. And I was the same. I'd always had this idea um, for a book in my mind, um, bits and pieces of things that would happen in my life. And I would just kind of store that thought away and think, oh, what's happening in my life right now? This should be in a book. And so that was kind of my inspiration was just to put little things together and at some point I got talking about it quite a bit and I started to really think it was time to challenge myself um, to actually uh, put it down on paper. And so I started with little pieces of paper like this. Uh, you can see this little card that I have that I use for other things in my studio here. But I started just writing a few sentences down on, on multiple cards that had a little summary of what I thought was going to be a neat little scene or turning point in my story that I wanted to put together. And when I had enough of these with little plot points, I laid them out on a table in my studio, literally laid these end to end. And then I started moving them around and thinking, well, this could go before this and this goes after this. And when I put them all together, it looked like I had about 37 chapters. And so then I just got a notebook like this and I stuck these little cards in the book on different pages and I would uh, have the idea written on the page on the little cards and then I would do some research and just make more handwritten notes on each page representing a chapter for the book and some things I needed to research further and other things just kind of came to me so this is kind of how I assembled everything if you can see it there it just was in kind of handwritten notes of chapters, um, little ideas in my head, some that I would use and some that I wouldn't. Then I got myself, I wanted, had to be very disciplined to actually make this happen. So I bought a brand new laptop and with a bit of research, I downloaded a program called Scrivener, which helps writers organize their whole book and be able to literally at the end of, of writing it, you can press a button and it puts it in a format that you can send it to a publisher. So the Scrivener application allowed me to keep track of how many words uh, I was 
putting into each chapter and how many words the whole book was going to be. And that was also something else I needed to research from the start was how long, how many words is in a novel, because I didn't want to finish it and find out that I'd only written a brochure. Uh, and I also didn't write, want to write something long, so long that nobody would ever read it if I handed you this great big volume to read. So I wanted to kind of find that sweet spot. So I kind of looked up online um, the average length of books and the average lengths of books that I like. And I read a lot of John Grisham novels, for instance. So I kind of want to be in that range, that size of a book. And that's kind of where I fit. I think, I think it finished out about 77,000 words. Um, and after I'd written the first chapter, I could sort of project um, based on the number of chapters I was going to have how many words it was going to be, and that all kind of worked out mathematically. Although, as I went along and did some research, um, the plot took little loops and it expanded a little bit in some areas. Part of the research, because for those of you who have read the book, a lot of the book uh, features one of my favorite artists, Frederick Remington, who was uh, quite a prolific painter at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s and painted a lot of Western subjects, cowboy and Indian type of subjects, as he would call them at the time, and, um, and then take them back to publish them in New York where he lived. And I had to research more and more about him other than just what I had online. I wanted to research more about his art. And the Frederick Remington Museum in Ogdensburg, New York, uh, is where they have all the information that you need about Frederick Remington. I contacted them. And the uh, curator of the museum, Laura, who's the character in my novel, uh, she was very excited about my novel ideas, and, and they were a big help to me uh, at the museum in putting together some extra detail uh, to my story that I never would have known if I hadn't talked to the museum. And so a lot of that, when you find that in the museum, it's as authentic as it could possibly be. And I've had the opportunity to go and speak to the members at the Frederick Remington Museum um, and read them some parts of my book that are very Remington detailed. And of course, they're even bigger experts of Remington than I am. And uh, they were quite excited by my book too. So that's been a very rewarding relationship with the Frederick Remington Museum um, since I'm such a fan of, of Remington. Then I had to, uh, so I've got a book written, um, I've got to get it published. And so I started doing a little bit of research along the way as to how to publish a book. Of course, the traditional way is to um, send your manuscript around to different publishers and hope that it arrives on someone's desk on the right day. And we've all heard the stories about how um, J.K. Rowling, the, the writer of Harry Potter, was turned down and other great books were turned down by publishers who just weren't reading them at the right time and didn't see the value in them. It wasn't a good fit for them. And I was thinking that I I couldn't really take that much rejection because I really wanted this to happen. And as a first time author, I thought I have no hope of sending this to a publisher and getting anywhere with it. And so I looked into the self-publishing op options and self-publishing. Uh, a lot of people think that self-publishing means that you, you know, you type it up and take it to Staples and they print out books for you to sell out of your trunk of your car or something like that. It doesn't really work that way. Self-publishing really means that you're going to self-fund it, put your money into it and get more money out of it, presumably, um, than doing through a traditional publishing. So I, I made the choice of Archway Publishing, which is a an arm of uh, Simon & Schuster. And they have great services that, that uh, an author can take advantage of and sort of pick and choose from their menu of, uh, of things that, that I needed and things I didn't need. Um, to put together my book and, and get it published and get it uh, printed and on Amazon. Uh, one unique thing about the book is that the publisher doesn't have copies of it on hand. They don't print any in advance. When you order a book on Amazon, like many of the books that you would order on Amazon, they, it's printed, your book is printed for you and sent to you. There's, it's a one-off book. There's no stock of books, which is quite interesting. You would kind of think there'd be a thousand of them sitting in a warehouse somewhere and they have to go to them, but they're actually printed one at a time from printers all over the world. So um, when you get a book, it's just one off. Uh, the next book off the printing press could be a cookbook or something else. 
Um, so that's how it works. I have that relationship with the, the publisher sells books. They sell on Amazon. I had a bunch to sell myself and I sold them all pretty quickly and I don't have any more to sell. I don't bother keeping any to sell when people can just buy them on Amazon and everybody's used to purchasing on Amazon. And according to many people, the delivery time has been, you know, within a week, you can get a hold of a copy. Um, it's been nice that people have brought books back to me to, to sign them for people. Um, always appreciate that. And, uh, and I've, again, had an opportunity to do uh, several of these book talks live where I get to uh, to visit with people. Um, I don't know if we have any questions that, that come to mind from the writing and the sort of technical part of it before we get into the story. Uh, feel free to go into that chat column on our on uh, the page there and, and uh, come up with a question if you want to ask a question as we go along. And maybe Shannon can just keep an eye on those and see if there's anything that I need to uh, to touch on. So I want to talk a little bit about the story and where the story comes from. So we're set in Ontario, Southern Ontario. It feels a lot like uh, where I live here in, in Orangeville, Caledon. Could be one of many, many towns um, sort of within an hour of, of Toronto. And my background was training horses. I did have a horse farm and I trained horses for full time for 30 years. I think I trained about 2000 horses. So I had a lot of experience um, in the industry and knowing sort of different parts of the industry from, uh, the bottom to the top. Um, and so I, I was able to set the book in that world. And then the book also takes some trips back in time. Um, we go back to, we, we go back, go to Oklahoma in 1975 or 76 and, um, and up into Nebraska. And I actually, um, did attend the Ada, the horse sale, the auction in Ada, Oklahoma in 1975. And from 1975 through 1978, I spent most of my summers on a ranch in Nebraska and traveled all around Nebraska with uh, the man who, who owned the place there that I worked with. And so I got to know a lot of rural Nebraska in the 70s. And so uh, the feeling that I put into the book about those experiences uh, can really come to life because of my knowledge about that. So that was really a fun part of the book. The book also has a lot of little turning points that um, are, I guess, uh, emotional turning points, I guess, that that uh, maybe people can identify with. There's, there's tragedy and loss. Um, there's financial hardship, and I want people to sort of feel the, the pain, but at the same time, uh, I want it to be uh, sort of hopeful. And so when one character dies in the book, um, we go back in time and on the next page, they're alive again. And I so, sort of support the reader in that you don't have to feel that that uh, pain of losing that character right away uh, when we're going to we're going to keep them in the story uh, for a while longer. I always notice that when I I'm watching a movie or a series on Netflix or something and I see a character die. I think, oh, well, that's it for them. I guess they're not getting paid anymore they're not in the series and then you find out there's flashbacks and they they're going to be in the series uh for the whole series we just keep seeing them at different in different times and i sort of have that in my book so i enjoy going back and forth in time um i wonder if there's any way with just uh, a show of hands or any way that we can see if there's um if everybody's read the book and uh and then we can sort of talk more in detail about uh, some of the characters. I see one hand, a hand went up. So there's, if you click on the hand, um, then we can tell that people have, have read it. I see Mary and I see Denise. And uh, if people click on it, if they've read it, it gives me an idea. And Marlene's read it, I see. I know Shannon's read it. And uh, so I want to touch on a little bit about the, um, uh, I guess, the the journey that the the main character Kella takes. Um, we sort of start in the, we start really in the middle of the story um, where we find out that she's got a problem and she's got her, her farm for sale. And um, she seems to be unhappy about that and we don't know why. Then we go back to the start of the story really, where we see things, general life around her farm, her relationship with her father, 
and how she develops a relationship with this bad boy named Damien. And Damien always, I want to be sort of a ticking time bomb in the book. And I wanted him to be um, sort of like a bad dog on a chain that you can just stay far enough away from him uh, that you don't have to be too concerned about him. But I want there always to be that threat that somehow Damien's going to blow something up and mess something up um, in Killa's world because he's made some bad decisions in his past and he's a bit dangerous. And so it was kind of fun um, having that that Damien character as sort of a, a, a darker cloud that hangs over uh, Kella, but um, she has a, an affinity um, for um, the underdog, I guess. Uh, you can see it how she treats animals. She likes the horses that nobody else wants. She wants to take that horse on and fix it up. And that's kind of in her nature is kind of to help the underdog. So she sees Damien as, as a, a, someone broken that she can fix and help. And, um, and we see that kind of, uh, effect that, that she has on, on him. Then we, um, so they start forming their relationship, but we see that there's a, a big conflict between Damien and Kella's father, Danby. And, uh, there's some situations arise where, um, it looks like Kella really has to keep her relationship with, with uh, Damien a secret because it's going to be something that her father just can't deal with. And ultimately it blows up in a scene in a restaurant where they've gotten together. Uh, Kella and Damien have met for lunch and Danby shows up. And while there's police there and everything, Danby goes into a big rant and, uh, is telling Damien to stay out of his daughter's life. And it sort of sets us up because eventually, um, if you've read the book, when Damien die, or when Danby dies, Damien finds Danby's body. We find out later that Kella hides the fact that Damien found the body from authorities. And we know that she does that, or we think, she must have done that to protect Damien's innocence. We know that he didn't um, harm Danby, but since there was a conflict that had been public, um, it could have been that Damien could end up being a suspect. And with Damien's sketchy past, uh, the town would probably think even more so that he was uh, culpable. So, so that was something that we see that, uh, um, I don't know if you noticed it, I hope you noticed that as a reader, that. Um, that Kella protected Damien's innocence by claiming that she found the body first. I'm seeing some questions. Um, are any of the characters based on real people in your life? You know, the, the quick answer for that is no, absolutely not. Um, and that's the honest answer. I wasn't basing anything on anybody and people try to find people that maybe I know that are like this. It was just really, I would, take a character and just make a sort of an amalgamation of, of people I know or that type of person. I, I say that all the characters are me ex except the little girl. Um, it's, it really all sort of comes from me, but um, they're not based on any, any particular people. And uh, someone ask, is asking, how did I come up with the name Kella? And it just kind of floated in my head. Like a lot of the names, I didn't spend a lot of time on it. It just kind of came up. I thought it was an easy name that when you see that in the story, it's a word that you don't see anywhere else in the book other than her name. And you probably don't know anybody named Kella. At least I didn't. And so it was easy to just lock in that that was going to be the main character with, uh, with kind of an unusual name. And the name Danby um, is my great grandfather's middle name. Uh, where Danby came from. So I thought that was kind of a cool name. Another thing with the name, you might have noticed that um, Kella's daughter's name is Corby. Well, Corby has a grandfather named Danby and a grandfather named Corwin. So we take Corwin and Danby and we get Corby. That's how, um, that's how Corby got her name. So um, probably not something that you noticed or cared about, but uh, that was where that name came from. Um, so that was 
you know, the um, names kind of came up like that. You could also find a lot of wildlife references in place names. I used a lot of animals. Um, the name of the golf course uh, that um, Kella's husband belongs to is Fox Cover. Um, the name of the farm where Damien lives is called Bear Paw. Um, there was just a lot of town names in Duckville where the where the uh, t story takes place in Duckville. And there was just a lot of other uh, wildlife references, I think, that you'd find throughout the book. Maybe the teams, names of some hockey teams and uh, other references like that. The Canadian stuff had a lot of wildlife in it. Another thing is the uh, hotel in Denver, uh, the Brown Hotel. Um, I'd never been there. But they had a website that has a lot of detail and video and a lot of information on it, right down to the, the menus and the restaurants and so on. So I was able to write a fairly authentic account of Kella's time there at the Brown Hotel in, in Denver. And I've spoken to at least one reader who has been to that hotel many times, and he couldn't believe that I hadn't been there because it was so authentic. But it was only because they have a really great website. I would love to go to the Brown Hotel in ben Denver, just putting it out there if they want me to do a book talk there any at any time soon um and um some of the other places just completely made up you know uh so the town names and so on but as we get closer to toronto there's some real towns i think i mentioned brampton um but otherwise in terms of small towns around ontario they're all made up um the town where there's a turning point takes place in um in nebraska uh redmond nebraska is made up and so is centennial nebraska that's just made up but it just seemed to be a good kind of a, it suited that that territory um, in the sand hills in Nebraska that uh, that I've traveled through before. So any other questions you want to type in? And then I'm going to, I'm going to read a chapter, probably my favorite chapter of the book. And um, I always kind of picture this chapter as a, as a scene in a movie. In fact, I, I picture the whole book as a movie. Um, if any of you want to help me make it into a movie, I'd appreciate that. Mark, I'll just comment that I could definitely, as I was reading it and I was able to picture it so well in my mind, I could definitely see it as being a movie for sure. Well, that was, a, that was really the, um, the experience I had writing it was I was thinking about it, writing it like a director directs a scene where I want, you know, to look around and see everything in the room and really have the viewer um, or the reader rather um, feel like the, the stage had been set for them in any of the locations. So um, it was kind of fun to uh, to kind of, you know, paint the picture really, which is what I do, and also uh, direct the movie at the same time uh, with the characters. Um, someone's asking if there's any chance of having a book signed when they get it. So absolutely, if you've got a copy of the book, if you can ever um, come down to my, uh, my studio at the Alton Mill Arts Center or find me anywhere else uh, in my travels, um, I'm always happy to, to sign books. I want to read a chapter from the book that, um, again, I don't think this spoils it for anybody who hasn't read the book, but this is really uh, kind of my favorite, and it's kind of shows a lot of the, uh, the types of characters that are in the book. I'm just going to have a sip of water. So at this point in the book, our character Danby, a young man in his late 20s, has um, been to a horse sale in Ada, Oklahoma, and he had a horse for sale there, and the selling of his horse didn't go very well at all. He didn't get nearly enough money uh, for the horse he had for sale. And so um, he's going to salvage this trip by looking up a person that he'd met a few years ago who owes him some money. Um, a horse deal went badly for him uh, years before in Louisville, Kentucky, and the man he's looking for that owes him money lives in Centennial, Nebraska. And so instead of Danby driving home to Ontario with an empty trailer, he's decided he's gonna drive up to Centennial, Nebraska and find this guy and uh, see if he can get some money from him. So <clears throat> we're with, with Danby and he's just about to leave the horse sale. Danby wasn't gonna waste any time getting out of Ada. He put his horse back in the stall and left him with a new halter and lead rope and the water bucket that was tied inside. He abandoned the remaining bale of hay in front and said, adios amigo, to the gelding as he carried his tack back to the truck. 
He was angry and humiliated, and he didn't even want to think about what his income and expenses had been on that horse, but he did it anyway. He figured that including the halter and the bucket, he was down about 400 bucks, and with gas at 59 cents a gallon, this trip was costing a lot more than expected. He was now certain that the only way to make this odyssey more profitable was to drive north to Nebraska and ambush that sneaky son of a bitch Galen Delfer and demand payment from him. Once he had his empty trailer hitched to his truck, he briefly considered checking in at the sales office to see if he could get paid to trailer any horses that needed to go north or east, but he quickly talked himself out of that idea. He would get a check in the mail in the few weeks for the horse, and he had no interest in running into the man with the mirrored sunglasses and allowing him to gloat over his shrewd horse purchase. I hope that horse kicks him right in that big goofy mustache, he thought, as he drove through the exit gate. Looking at the mileage legend on the map in his well-worn atlas and doing some rough measurements, he figured he had about an 11 hour drive to get to Centennial, Nebraska and the G Bar D Ranch. He would drive as far as he could tonight and then he hoped he would be able to surprise Galen in the middle of the day tomorrow. The sun was starting to set to his left as he rolled down the window of his truck and rested his arm on the opening. He turned up the radio and listened to Waylon Jennings singing about a good-hearted woman. According to the map, he could get around Oklahoma City just after the Friday night traffic, and he would try to make it as far as Salina, Kansas, before he stopped for the night. He kept replaying the day's events, and each time he questioned himself more. Maybe he should have let that girl ride the horse. No doubt he should have negotiated with the man in the sunglasses before the sale. Maybe he should have put a reserve bid on the horse, but then he would have been hauling him home right now without a penny to show for it. Danby consoled himself with the notion that if the horse business was easy, then everybody would be doing it. At 10.30, Danby spotted a vacancy sign on the Wagon Wheel Motel, just a few miles north of Salina, Kansas. He entered the small room with the fake wood paneling, cranked up the air conditioner in the window, and turned on the TV before he got in the shower to rinse away every speck of horse sale dirt that he'd brought with him. He set his cowboy hat upside down on the dresser rather than on the bed, honoring the cowboy superstition that it's bad luck to place your hat on a bed. He wondered how much worse his luck could get anyway. He watched the 11 o'clock news as he lay in his underwear on top of the cool sheets. The presidential election was a hot topic with Jimmy Carter and vice presidential running mate Walter Mondale gaining ground on the incumbent Republican President Gerald Ford with Bob Dale, Dole. In sports, California Angels pitcher Nolan Ryan added another win to his impressive career, but the reporter forecasted that at 29 years of age, his arm probably wouldn't last much longer, considering how hard he threw the ball. Anybody who knows Nolan Ryan knows that he'd pitch longer than anybody else in baseball. In other news, doctors were still searching for clues in the strange deaths of 29 people at an American Legion convention in Philadelphia. Danby flipped through the four channels and settled on an episode of Charlie's Angels. He fell asleep with the TV on and woke up at two with nothing but static on the screen as the station had shut off for the night. Remember, it's 1976. The next morning, he was on the road at 7.30. An hour later, he stopped at a cafe in Concordia and got a coffee in a styrofoam cup. Just north of Interstate 80, Danby was looking for a spot where he could park his trailer and pick it up on the way back to Ontario. This would make the drive a bit easier and more fuel efficient. In York, Nebraska, he located the York County Fairgrounds and drove in looking for a place he could abandon the trailer until tonight. He noticed a man cutting grass and he got out of his truck and approached him. Good morning, sir. Is there any chance I could park my horse trailer here for the day? I'm coming back this way tonight. It would be easy if I didn't have to tow it all day. It ain't stolen, is it? The man replied. Oh, no, it's mine. Ontario plates, just like my truck. I suppose you can leave it next to the mercantile building over there. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. By noon, he was into the renowned Nebraska Sandhills. This was a region very different from the Platte River Valley of southern Nebraska. He passed herds of red Hereford cattle, as well as black Angus. Next to a lake, Danby spotted some mule deer grazing on what was known as some of the best grasses on the planet. He drove by a ranch that had an old cowboy boot nailed upside down over every fence post along the highway frontage and down the lane. This region was also known for its migratory bird population with sandhill cranes, geese, pheasants, and quail that feasted on the wild chokecherry and wild plum thickets. 
Engrossed by the landscape, Danby hadn't noticed until now that his gas tank was nearly empty. The last town he drove through was noted on his map, but was nothing more than a crossroads with a boarded up general store and a few grain silos. As he feared getting stranded without any gas in the middle of nowhere, he began looking for farms that might have fuel tanks on the property for their trucks and machinery. It wasn't long before Danby could see two galvanized steel 500 gallon tanks propped up on a rusty scaffold next to some buildings by the road. He drove in and pulled up next to the tanks, then got out of the truck and started to look around to find someone to buy some gas from. The property in included nothing more than a few weathered implement sheds and a feedlot containing about 20 assorted commercial beef steers hovering around a concrete water trough next to a windmill. There was a stand of overgrown trees surrounding the crumbling foundation that used to support a farmhouse. The windmill gave a screech tick tick sound that repeated with each revolution of the blades. The cows started bawling when he approached, but there was no sign of human life anywhere. He decided the only thing to do was to put enough fuel in the truck to get to the next town and leave some money in the spout handle. The fuel tanks were painted in dripping red letters. One had the word gas and the other had the letters diesel. Danby tapped his knuckles on the tanks to determine if they had anything in them. He had no sooner removed the truck's gas cap and inserted the nozzle into the tank when a cloud of dust announced the arrival of a black Chevy 4x4 pickup coming down the driveway toward him. Attached behind the truck was a low trailer loaded with aluminum irrigation pipe. The truck came to an abrupt stop in front of Danby's truck as if to block his escape, and the driver quickly stepped out and called to Danby, what the hell is going on here? The thickly built man looked to be about 24 years old. He was wearing a dirty Nebraska corn huskers cap and a plaid western shirt with the sleeves cut off. Danby couldn't help but notice the fact that he was missing half his left arm just below the elbow. I was hoping I could buy enough gas to get to the next town. <laughs> Seems like I didn't plan too well, said Danby, smiling and trying his best to deflect the tension of the situation. From the passenger side of the truck, a boy about 13 years old got out. He was shirtless and dirty and looked like he'd spent his summer doing a man's work. He walked up to Danby, stood with his hands on his hips, and looked him up and down. The man relaxed his stance and said, no problem at all, we can fix you up. Then he spoke to the boy. Bo, put some gas in the man's truck. Just $5 worth would be great, said Danby. I don't want to trouble you. There was no gauge on the tank and no way to know exactly how much fuel was being dispensed. You're a long way from home, the man said, looking at the license plate on Danby's truck. Is Ontario a state, the boy said. It's not a state, you idiot. It's a providence. It's up north in Canada, said the one-armed man. Actually, I live straight east from here, said Danby, to blank stares. Are you really from Canada? Do you live in an igloo? Do you play ice hockey? Do you drink maple syrup? The boy asked in rapid succession. Shut up and just pump the gas, will you? The man scolded. What brings you around here, he asked. I'm going up to visit someone in Centennial, Danby said. Centennial, the man said, laughing with disbelief. There's nothing in Centennial. Who the hell are you going to find up there? I'm looking for a man named Galen Delfer, actually. Ever heard of him? Sure, I've heard of him. Played high school football with his son, Jimmy. Hell of a ball player. We were even in Vietnam together. I got off lucky, I guess. The man looked down at his stump of an arm. Poor bastard, he said quietly, as he looked off across the horizon. The three stood in silence for a moment. So that should be enough, Danby said to the boy, handing a $5 bill to the man. Thanks again. You saved me from getting stranded. Danby turned the key in his truck and watched the red needle on the fuel gauge go all the way up to the F as he drove out the laneway. For the next 20 minutes, he passed only one other vehicle. There was a pickup truck heading south, pulling a stock trailer with no roof over it. In the trailer were two horses with saddles on them. The next town he came to was Redmond, Nebraska, which consisted of four corners and a stop sign. There was a gas station with a mechanic's garage on the side and the Crazy Crane Cafe, which was a welcome sight. He parked in front of the cafe and went inside. Inside the door was a bulletin board with announcements and posters and handwritten advertisements of all kinds. A farm and livestock auction, a county fair and rodeo, hay for sale, ranch help wanted, Australian shepherd puppies available. The place was empty other than a waitress wiping off the long counter in front of a row of red swivel stools with chrome bases. Her name tag said Myrna. 
And she was quietly humming along to Olivia Newton-John singing, Have You Ever Been Mellow? There was a framed photo of President Gerald Ford on the wall, an autographed picture of Miss Rodeo, Nebraska, 75, and even an 8x10 photo of the stallion D. Bar Beaumont himself. Coffee, honey, said Myrna, as Danby took a seat at the counter. Yes, please, and a menu. Not exactly a full house here for lunch on a Saturday, eh? Hoose? Did you say hoose? Where are you all from, darling? I live just about an hour out of Toronto, Ontario, said Danby. Well, I could tell from that accent that you ain't from around here. What on earth brings you to Redmond, handsome? Myrna looked to be in her early 60s. She was wearing blue eyeshadow and deep red lipstick. Her sizable bosom was packed into a red gingham blouse, and she was wearing tight white jeans tucked into red cowboy boots. I'm not here to visit someone. Galen Delfer, have you heard of him? Heard of him, said Myrna. I've known him all my life. And she called to the cook who was scraping the grill at the other end of the open kitchen. Earl, this fellow's from Canada, and he's come to see Galen. Galen Delfer, said Earl without looking up. No, Galen Eisenhower. Who do you think, meathead? Earl came over and stood in front of Danby, lowered his chin to his chest, and stared seriously at Danby with his eyes up under his bushy eyebrows. What sort of business do you have with Galen Delfer, he said in a deep voice. Well, actually, we've done some horse trading in the past, and I just needed to settle a few things with him, said Danby. Well, there ain't much left of him to settle, said Earl. Myrna stepped in and broke the tension with anything on the menu that suits your fancy. Can I still get breakfast even though it's afternoon, he asked. Just a sec, sugar, let me check. Earl, are you still serving breakfast, she shouted to Earl, who had gone back to the stove. They both chuckled as she said, of course, baby doll, you're the only one here. You can have whatever you like. Okay, I'm pretty hungry. What, what are the teddy bear pancakes, he asked, pointing at the menu. Oh, those are something Earl does for the little kids. He makes a teddy bear face out of the batter and uses chocolate chips to make the eyes and the nose, said Myrna, smiling. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just have two regular pancakes, three eggs over medium, <clears throat> and sausages, please. Coming right up, she said, as she topped up Danby's coffee, spoiling the ratio of cream and sugar to coffee. Danby spun around on his stool to take a look at the crazy crane. He wondered if there was ever a time when all the tables and chairs were filled. There was a jukebox against one wall and an assortment of taxidermy mounts hung above, a white-tailed buck with impressive antlers, a large-mouthed bass, and a comical jackalope, which was a taxidermist's classic prank to create a mythical cross between a jackrabbit and an antelope with horns mounted on a rabbit's head. In the parking lot, a brown Dutch Monaco with sheriff painted on the side in yellow letters pulled up and parked next to Danby's truck. Danby watched the driver door open and the sheriff step out as he put on a crisp straw cowboy hat. Took a long look at Danby's license plate before he came into the cafe. What took you so long, Cordell? Myrna said as she set a tall glass on the counter and poured some brewed iced tea from the side of the pitcher, letting a few ice cubes splash into the glass. Cordell Wyman didn't miss much in this region. When he saw a strange vehicle without estate plates at the cafe, he made it his business to check it out. Sheriff Wyman looked as though retirement couldn't be too far off. His pot belly spilled over his belt that carried a holstered pistol and a walkie-talkie. Near ways from home, he said to Danby as he sat next to him and took a sip of tea. He's here to see Galen, <clears throat> said Myrna, before Danby could answer. Delfer, said the sheriff. Seriously, said Myrna, are there any other Galens around here that I don't know about? I don't know if you're aware, son, said Cordell. Galen Delfer hasn't been doing so well since his boy Jimmy passed. Fucking war, said Earl, without looking up from the stove. Boy could have been playing pro football by now instead of getting shot in the jungle by some Chinaman. Simmer down, Earl, said Myrna. I guess the G bar D is in jeopardies, Earl said in a sing-song voice that he'd used before on that line. The sheriff turned to Danby. Truthfully, there ain't much left of Galen Delfer. I don't know what you're going to find when you get up there. Last time I saw him was about six weeks ago when I had to go out with a utilities rep to shut off his electricity. I've been out there months ago when they unplugged his phone lines. When we saw him, I convinced the electrician to leave him alone. I doubt he'll need it for too long. Seems he's planning to drink himself to death. Myrna leaned over the counter between the men and set down Danby's meal. Three eggs and sausages with white toast on one plate, and next to that, a plate 
with two teddy bear pancakes with chocolate chip smiles looking up at Danby. The sheriff stared at the plate and then raised an eyebrow to Danby. Earl was watching the reaction from behind the counter and they all had a good laugh at the Canadian's expense. Danby attacked the meal while Cordell sipped his tea and Murda and Earl busied themselves behind the counter. As he was finishing, Earl came over with a paper bag and set it in front of Danby. That's for Galen, he said. A clubhouse sandwich, it's his favorite. That's what he always orders when he comes in, says Myrna. He'll be back. He's just got a touch of melancholy, that's all. Everyone grieves in their own way. I know Galen, he's going to be fine. Earl and the sheriff looked at each other and rolled their eyes with the unanimous belief that the next time Galen Delfer left his house, it would be in a pine box. What do I owe you for the breakfast, asked Danby. That's on the house, good looking. Myrna said, you deliver that sandwich and check in on Galen, and we'll be all square. Cordell Wyman followed Danby out the door into his truck. He reached into his police cruiser and got a fresh pack of Marlboro cigarettes from the glove box. He tossed them to Danby. Give these to Galen, will you? Tell him Cordell sent them. And another thing. The officer paused and squinted his eyes as he looked far across the hills. Like I said, I, I don't know what you're going to find up there, but if there's anything we need to know about, then you check back in and let us know, okay? Yes, sir. I sure will, said Danby, as he closed his door and started the truck. So that gives you a little taste of the, uh, the book, some of the type of characters in it, the style of writing that I, that I do. And uh, that's the kind of territory that I was pretty familiar with. Uh, when I was working on a ranch in Nebraska in the 70s. In fact, Miss Rodeo Nebraska 75, I say there's a picture of her on the wall in the restaurant. And I was actually with Miss Rodeo Nebraska 75 when she was crowned Miss Rodeo Nebraska 75, Melanie Califf from uh, Kearney, Nebraska, so or Grand Island, Nebraska. So um, it was kind of fun to put somebody I, I actually know in the uh, in the book in that spot as well. Um, let's see what other comments uh, there is. Just people uh, enjoyed that, which uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that you've enjoyed it. And that's just a real favorite. And again, um, I always picture if I was just even going to film one scene, just to film that scene of the uh, in, in that crazy crane cafe with Myrna and Earl behind the counter with Danby and the uh, sitting down and the sheriff coming in. I just would love to just create create that scene alone. The teddy bear pancakes, I will say, that was actually a joke that was pulled on me when I was the only person who was in a uh, a cafe, probably in Iowa somewhere, driving back with some horses uh, when I was probably about 28 years old or something. And uh, I, I went through the same thing. I had asked if what are the teddy bear pancakes, and then I didn't order them, but they sure enough made me teddy bear pancakes anyway, and uh, had a little joke. So that was. Uh, where that came from. It didn't actually just come out of my imagination. It actually happened to me. Um, so um, any other questions? Don't want to Mark, I'll just, I'll just make a comment while we're waiting for some more to come in. Um, so I, I really enjoyed the story. You did so much in terms of painting that picture in our minds and the cast of characters, which each, you know, had their own complexity to the way you painted all the different scenes for us from the horse farms to the auctions, um, to the states and the towns. But even for those of us who aren't part of that horse life and that equestrian life, we were a really able to picture it and to kind of imagine ourselves in those different places. And it was neat to, to learn those inner workings of all of that, you know, of that sort of lifestyle. Um, and the wildlife that you brought into the stories as well, the teddy bear pancakes, like you just mentioned, and how they make another appearance in the story, I thought was really neat to kind yeah. of come from full Sorry. circle, um, and we won't reveal why. And then, of course, the surprises and the twist that kept us intrigued and wanting us to read more. And one of the elements of the story that I really appreciated and that surprised me was the poetry. And I know I mentioned this to you, but I wondered if you could just touch on, on how you incorporated poems into, into your story. Yeah, so people that have read the book know that um, Danby, the character in the book, Kella's father, is a um, uh, cowboy poet. He's written some poems. And um, early on in the book, uh, we see one of his poems that he's inspired by a situation where he feels like um, he's a bit of a fish out of water these days as uh, modern life is creeping into his old ways. And so he writes a poem that kind of reflects that. And I put that poem in. And later on in the book, Kella finds some of his poems and, and uh, we got a chance to read his poems. Now, these poems I actually wrote 
um, a few years ago. They were written before I wrote the book, um, but I'd never published them. I'd only perform them live. Um, I perform them without holding them in front of me. I perform them like a like a performance, like a play. And so I uh, always had fun at different big events that I would travel to and, and uh, get to perform some of my cowboy poetry. But this book turned into a vehicle for publishing them um, by making Dan be a poet. Uh, I could put these right in the book, so now they, they're published. I think there's five or six in the book. And my idea with them was I knew people would read the first one um, because it's right there in the, in the story. Later on, uh, you're kind of into the story. Kella finds these poems, and I know that you want to get on with the story, and it gives you a chance. I could read them now. I could read them later. I could skip them all together. I, um, I don't. I don't really care if the if the reader takes the time to read them or if they just get back to the plot of the story. But um, uh, so many people have said that they. Uh, some people even said that was the best part of the book was the the cowboy poetry. So that's a that was fun. I, I really enjoyed writing those as well. So you have a few more comments coming through. Uh, mm -hmm. Denise said uh, she loves the cover and the clues in the cover. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about the cover just just a moment. You can see that yeah. on the um, behind me here, and I have out of reach the the original painting. And uh, and so you can see on the on the cover here, we see a farm in the, in the winter, a pond with ice on it down here, and the sunset. And there's actually a point. <coughs> excuse me. There's a point in the book that I want the reader to get to that um, you would look at the cover and realize there that's where we are. And it's, it's at the moment where uh, Damien has walked into the barn and given some very bad news uh, to Kella. And that's like a big, you know, punch in the, in the chest kind of a moment in the book. And that's really, that's the moment that you see on the cover, but those of you who have the book, um, I want you to take a closer look at the pond, and um, there's something there that you probably never even noticed before. So, so uh, um, just another little hidden hidden thing on the on the cover. Yeah, that that's really neat. I have that book in front of me, and I did not notice that. And now so you see it, and you think, how could I miss? How could I miss that big clue? Is right there. Yes. On the front of the book. Um, Stephanie has uh, mentioned, you mentioned the film. Have you ever thought about what characters or what actors, sorry, would play the characters in the novel? Oh, for sure. Now that, that's <laughs> something I, I had a lot of fun with. Um, right from the start, I um, had a photograph um, that I saved of every, every character. I found people online. Sometimes they were actors and actresses. Sometimes they were just uh, random people. Um, so I could sort of focus on their features and sort of get a feel for them. And I collected a whole bunch of, of characters of all the main uh, characters. Um, I don't really have a particular actress in mind um, for um, for Kella or, or anything. I mean, Jack Palance, if you remember Jack Palance, he died a few years ago, but he was in City Slickers. And I thought he would be um, Galen Delfer, um, you know, just kind of a creepy old cowboy. Um, he would. He was my image of, of Galen Delfer. Um, probably Danby. Um, of course, right now I can't think of the actor's name. Uh, nope, it's gone from my head. But um, I've had some ideas, but nothing nothing specific. I would probably want to play Cordell, the uh, the sheriff that we just saw in, the, in that in that scene right there. So that's uh, that's all for me. Evelyn has commented that she must read this book to find out what happens next. So you left her on a bit of a cliffhanger. Yes. And yeah. Marlene, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, well, yeah, that chapter alone is a cliffhanger because what is um, what is Danby gonna find when he, when he goes to visit Galen? What's he gonna find? Is he gonna get his money from him? And uh, this guy sounds like he's in such rough shape after his son died in Vietnam. And um, I had the time, the timing of the, uh, the timeline of the book was kind of an interesting process. Because it spans 100 years, um, I had to figure out where everything fit on a timeline of 100 years, when people would be born, when they would die. And this was my, I had a very sophisticated way of plotting all this. And this was just by writing it all down on a, uh, a chart like this, very as to when things would happen. And um, I had to um, time some of it at, from the end of the Vietnam War. Um, so the, the son, 
uh, Jimmy Delford that I mentioned in that chapter that I wrote that wrote that died in the Vietnam War, he had to be one of the last casualties of the Vietnam War um, in order to fit my plot. And I tried to research more about, um, I contacted a Vietnam vet's Facebook page and tried to get some information from them as to where in Vietnam, what are the last battles, like where could someone have died and what would have happened? And I, I didn't get anywhere with that, that research. So I had to leave that a little bit vague. That was something that I was kind of disappointed that I didn't bring a little more detail to the death of, of Jimmy Delfour in Vietnam. But a lot of people, a lot of family members, of course, um, didn't even know how their loved ones uh, died. So um, that was, uh, you know, such a, for, the, for those of us who were alive in the, in the 70s, that was such a, you know, a big part of life, not only in the U.S., um, but even for those of us in Canada, um, the state of the Vietnam War and uh, our, our fear for the, uh, for the soldiers who'd been conscripted to, uh, to fight there. So well, it's, a, it's a really neat part of the writing process, especially when you consider how many true elements you brought into the story from history to painting those scenes for us, that you really have to do that research um, because you never know which reader you're going to have that's going to have a personal connection to whether it's that place, like you were saying, that restaurant or that hotel or to something like Vietnam and wanting to make sure you, you get it right for the reader. Yeah. And not only and especially the horse, the horse part that I wrote, mm -hmm. but I didn't want the horse part to be so so authentic that it meant nothing to um, readers that aren't into horses. At the same time, you know, I'll watch a medical uh, show like Grey's Anatomy, even though I, I don't know how to operate on somebody, you feel like you've learned enough um, by watching a show like that. So hopefully people that aren't into horses maybe learn something about the business, but people that are into horses know that everything I talk about is authentic. A lot of it follows Damien's life as a farrier, shoeing horses, and trimming horses' feet and that kind of stuff, and that's something that I'm so familiar with that when I describe it, I'm, I'm the tools he's using and what he's doing is exactly the way um, it would be done. So I like that. I'm, I'm proud of that authenticity as well. Marlene has asked if you'll write another book to continue Kella's life adventures. You know, I I I love the process of writing it. I I don't love the process of trying to sell them, and um, and that kind of that part of it. Um, if I wrote a second book, I would want a reader to be able to read them out of order and it still makes sense. So I don't want to continue the story, but it, we might look at Kella's life, um, indifferently, but you could go back and read this one as the first one. I, I don't have any, honestly, any immediate plans of, of writing. Um, the process for me, I don't think I mentioned, I wrote the whole thing in Starbucks, um, that was my go-to place. I would go to Starbucks in the afternoon and I wrote it in four months in total uh, time. And I knew right from the start how long it was going to take. And I finished it right on, right on four, four months, uh, 16 weeks of writing pretty much every weekday afternoon for a few hours uh, sitting in Starbucks. So that was my go-to place. I don't, I don't do any work at home. I do my artwork here in my studio where I'm happen to be sitting tonight and, uh, I needed somewhere different. Um, to sort of break that routine and not have any distractions except for lots of distractions of people coming and going in Starbucks, of course, lots of noise. People sit down and talk with me all the time while I'm sitting in Starbucks because uh, people know me. And then, uh, but I really enjoyed having that energy around me anyway. So that works for me. And just to carry out Marlene's question, uh, maybe not specific to this novel, but do you have other characters in mind for maybe another story that you might write? Definitely. I, I want to create a, um, a veterinarian who is um, uh, devious, criminal, somehow. Um, so everybody thinks he's great. Um, everybody thinks he's doing the best thing for their horses, but he's actually not doing that at all. And so um, from what I know about how veterinarians operate, I don't know anybody that has any, um, any of that kind of <laughs> devious behavior, but I want to talk to, I would talk to veterinarians about what would be um, or maybe they have heard of someone who's broken the rules. Um, for instance, a veterinarian who was actually making making an animal, making your horse sick so that you could so that he could get more money by treating it or something like something like that, or maybe some other scheme. Um, horrible to think about, but it, it 
might be an interesting point in a book is to have a, a, a veterinarian who everybody thinks is on the up and up and actually isn't. Evelyn has said, oh no, not a bad veterinarian. I love my cat's vet. Laughing well, it won't, get, it won't be a cat vet, I can, I can assure you. It'll, it'll be a horse vet. And there's, there's always room in the horse business for all kinds of skullduggery. So, so uh, your, your cat vet's probably a great vet, Evelyn. And we just have a, one final comment there from Evelyn or question. Is a cover from a photo of a farm you owned or have seen? And I know you've got it behind you too, so I don't know if you wanted to, yeah. to show that pond yeah. scene there as well. The pond is down here. Um, no, it's just kind of made up. I'd already written the story, and so I had to create a farm that kind of fit the, um, the description that I put in the book. There's a bit of a, you know, an old barn with a renovated stable here. There's an indoor arena across here that's not attached and an old farmhouse. This is a little addition here that would be um, Dan B's apartment attached to the side of the farm there. And it's just kind of a, an imaginary, imaginary place. Great, and, and Tiffany has just shared, she said an awesome time and to have a great night. And you get a couple more comments coming through, it looks like. Anything else before we wrap it up? And people are always, you know, I, I love talking about the book. So if people want to ever message me through uh, Facebook or email, I'm easy to find. Um, and you can always ask me more questions about details of the of the book, because I know there's there's too much to cover. My dream would be for some grade 11 uh, English class to be reading this as required reading and then having to discuss it in detail. And you also have, you were saying, or I think I saw it online, that your gallery, people can go in and view the gallery right now. Is it by appointment only? Yeah, so our building, because we're in the region of Peel, the Alton Mill Arts Center itself, where I'm located, has to be closed to the public. But like every store and restaurant, we can do sort of curbside delivery or by appointment. We can let one person at a time or two people in at a time to our space and um, had, I've had people, uh, you know, make an appointment to come and visit my, my gallery. And uh, I've also, this time of year, I do a lot of commission artwork of, uh, um, for people giving us Christmas gifts. I think I still have three, <clears throat> three more paintings to complete uh, before Christmas at, that are going out as gifts. And um, so people are always coming to pick up their commission painting paintings that I finished as well. Sometimes I, I ship them. I shipped one out today, but um, often people are coming to visit. So my studio is here on the on the ground level or kind of basement level in the building. And then I have a, a gallery space on the upper level as well. There's about 18 or 20 paintings uh, displayed up there in the gallery as well. OK, great. Good to know. And Marlene has shared. Thank you, Mark. Enjoyed hearing you read you reading your favorite chapter. Thank you, Marlene. Okay. Yes, and thank you everyone for joining us. Very good. Thanks everybody. And again, uh, pass it on if uh, if you know anybody else who might want to read this book. Uh, you can probably still get one in time for Christmas. And I really appreciate everybody uh, uh, listening in tonight. It's uh, always a pleasure to uh, to share the story. So thank you very much, and thanks, Shannon. No problem. Thank you so much. Okay, let's wrap it up. We're done. We're done. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye now. Bye.